Tales from the Dark Multiverse, Crisis on Infinite Earths issue 1, finds Tempest Fugonaut observing a dark multiverse where the crisis of infinite earths happens. But unlike in the prime multiverse, the crisis happens on Earth 2. And in the aftermath of the crisis, Kal-El of Earth is the one who gazed in horror from the cosmic treadmill, finding a void where his home once stood. While in the prime universe, the JSA disappeared, locked in a battle to avert Ragnarok, on the dark Earth, Surtur's armies rose to strike in Earth's infancy, destroying the Justice League and killing millions. Tempest knows that the League were heroes, but their numbers were fewer since they were strangers on an unknown Earth, still reeling from a crisis, and their Superman was sent away to his own dimension with his lowest lane by Alexander Luther, which hindered their power further. Soon the new Earth came under a fire yet again from Surta, who arrives to kill the infant Earth before it even has a chance. Freed from Asgard, Surta arrived on Earth to begin his path of destruction, but the new Earth wasn't without its heroes as the All-Star Squadron rose to battle Surta. The aged Alan Scott leads the squadron, telling Surta they've defeated the Anti-Monitor and have defended the world for decades and even reality itself. So what makes him think he can stand up to the All-Star Squadron? Surta is sure he can, recognising Green Lantern's symbol, showing Alan the charred suit of Hal Jordan, saying the Lantern spoke big like Alan, so he bit off his ring arm and set his blood on fire. Surtur says, like what he did with Asgard and the Justice League before them, the All-Star Squadron will suffer and they are stupid if they think they can stop him. Alan says that he knows all about Surtur thanks to the Spectre who sent the League ahead of them, but now they are Earth's only defense and they are damn good at putting genocidal maniacs in their place. Surtur spits fire, knowing that if the heroes face him, their friends and family will never stop dying. The Squadron race into battle as Surtur uses his sword to kill Hawkman and Silver Scarab, with the team told by Dr. Fate to weep for them later as Surta continues to kill more and more of the heroes, even using Hawkwoman's mace to behead Dr. Fate. Out of Naboo's helmet grows the Spectre, who confronts the mocking Surta. Surta says that why should he mock when he could just feast, biting the Spectre's head off. The heroes on the ground scatter as the Spectre's lifeless giant corpse smashes into the ground, right on top of Dynamite and TNT, whose power is unleashed in their deaths in a huge explosion which kills Robin. Surta soon confronts Fury, telling the scared woman that once her bones are charred, killing her mother won't be sport and he's already killed a younger, stronger Wonder Woman. The squadron's Wonder Woman's invisible jet soon arrives and Diana crashes it headfirst into Surta, thrown from the crash where she is helped by a Green Lantern, telling the hero that everything is far from okay now. Despite the explosion, Surta's jaw is the only thing that is damaged on the being and he is still able to unlock unleash a torrent of hellfire. Nuclon is burned by the fire as Superman tries to protect Wonder Woman, but the fire burns even him and even kills Diana, turning her to ash. The injured Clark tells the dead Wonder Woman that in her and everyone else's name, he will make sure Surta will fall. Power Girl tells him that he's wounded and he can't win this battle, but Earth needs Superman to win this war, so he needs to go and she'll buy her cousin some time. Clark says that Supergirl already did that and she died, and he cannot let that happen to Power Girl as well. Power Girl says that Kara Zor-El knew what her cousin meant to the world, and Kara Zor-El is no different from her other world counterpart. Kara says that this is a job for Power Girl as she battles Surta, killed in the fight. Surta proclaims himself victor over the heroes, telling what heroes still live to stay hidden in their holes and live what little life he is willing to afford them. And if they are smart, they will not impede his march across the world. Elsewhere, Starman hides what's left of the heroes in the Perisphere, which is protected by Johnny Thunder's Thunderbolt and his Cosmic Rod. The small group of heroes regroup, mourning the loss of their many friends and family members. Johnny tells his Thunderbolt to hold it together since the heroes are counting on him, but Starman and tells him the whole earth is counting on them all. And if there's one thing he knows about the Justice Society, it's that they are survivors. Clark says that all this happened so fast, and while he lost Krypton, he was never there to watch that happen, and he hasn't seen death on this scale ever. He wonders what happened to him since he fought and people still died, wondering whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. Lois tells him he's standing right there with her, and if there's anything she knows, it's that Kara is still out there since stubbornness runs 
runs in the family. But what doesn't run in the family is self-pity, reminding her husband to keep his chin up since he will get up and show Surtur who he is and who he's been for the last 50 years, Superman. Clark tells his wife she always knows how to catch him as Sandman looks at Sandy's mask, remembering when he came long after Deanne's death and how it meant he never had to face nightmares alone again. But now he knows that was all just fantasies and after today, there will be no need to dream of future horrors since the Sandman lives in a nightmare all his own. Johnny Thunder meanwhile comments on how Ted Grant is now more bandaged than man but Ted tells him that it helps him remember the last fight and get ahead of the next one. The Thunderbolt stirs in Johnny's pocket as he talks about being one of the last to be standing, never thinking it would get this far for him and while he knows none of them are kids anymore, it sure feels like it since what good is a JSA mascot against the demon Surtur. Ted suits up, telling Johnny that he always knew it was going to be him and the kid at the end, being that they are both the fists and the heart of the JSA. Sarman and Flash Mimo lay out a plan to try and battle Surtur theorizing that opening a miniature black hole powered by a Surtur's own energy under him should make the villain consume himself, finally killing him off. Sarman finds Jay's plan incredible, knowing that this is a new field of physics he's just invented. Jay wants to worry about the patterns after the apocalypse, as Ted mentions how Dr. Midnight and Owlman would love to see this. The men remember that their friends are long gone however, and the Flash reassures his friend that they will beat this threat as Starman lights his rod, knowing Knowing that the right idea always beats the right problem and if the beast burns like a sun then he'll burn out like one too. Huntress goes to see Hawkgirl knowing that since so much has changed so fast the winged hero is trying to change with it. Helena bluntly says that Hawkman is dead and Shira wants to honor him and she's now trying to see how she can also honor Robin and she was at this point when her mother and father died as well wondering just how the daughter of Batman and Catwoman honors both of their legacies. Helena realized that it was by four her own path in both of their names. Shaira knows that Helena is right, knowing that when she dies, she'll be reborn with Hawkman again. But right now, the world needs her, so she'll honor Carter by taking up his mantle as Hawkwoman. Helena finds Aquaman nearby, surprised to see he's there since she never took him as a joiner. But Arthur tells her he's been his father's science project ever since the first day he lived, becoming the first man to breathe underwater, and he's never meant for proper society. But he fought with Batman in the big one before this, so when it's the end of the world, everyone is on the team, including him. In her room away from everyone, Fury throws off her own tiara, mourning the death of her mother Wonder Woman, not ready to be without her for the first time in her life and take up her mantle. Diana speaks with Lyda through the tiara, telling her daughter that this is thanks to the one final gift that Olympus had for her. Diana bestows one final bit of wisdom on her daughter, telling her that in her youth, she wasn't ready to leave Themyscira and become Wonder Woman, but man's world was crushed crying out in pain and she needed to answer. Diana tells Lyda that ready or not, the Earth is crying out and Wonder Woman needs to answer the call. Elsewhere, Obsidian is frustrated that they are just hiding out while Circa wreaks havoc across the world. Alan is sorry for putting his son through this and today for once, he wants to be there for him. Todd says that Alan didn't know he or Jeannie Lynn were still alive, but Alan knows he curses himself every day because of that. Todd says that his mother is long gone, as are his stepmother and stepsister that he never really knew, and maybe that's for the better, since without time with them, maybe it hurts less. He tells Alan not to apologize since he can't always save the world. Alan knows his friends and family followed him today and he failed, but he will not lose anyone else and while he doesn't have to save the world every time, he wants to do it one more time for his son. He knows the light his son is hiding inside himself and when this is over, Todd needs to live that light. Surtur meanwhile continues to wreak havoc throughout earth, boiling the oceans as suddenly lightning begins to strike the water around the villain and the seas begin to part, rising up above the villain and trapping him. He wonders who rebels against him in the water as the Justice Society of Earth confronts him. Surtur isn't one bit phased by the heroes as Alan says that the villain isn't the first to hurt them and they always get back up. The JSE says that after what the villain has done with them, they can easily go 1200 rounds with him, but Surtur only cares about who will strike first. Lighter is the first to strike, hitting the villain with the fury of the Wonder Woman. The villain squashes her. Lighter, however, isn't killed, ripping through Surtur's hand as the Green Lantern construct armored Wildcat smashes through the fire demons. Thank 
thanking Alan for making him feel the best he's ever felt in years. He calls for Johnny to join in, wondering what the man is doing, as Johnny tells the Thunderbolt that it's time to help out but the Thunderbolt is scared. Johnny says that the Thunderbolt has something the Spectre and Dr. Fate didn't have, heart, and his best friend Johnny Thunder. Activating his belt, Johnny is covered with the Thunderbolt's energy, which becomes an armor for the man, allowing him to join Wildcat as they rip through the fire demons. While the heroes battle the demons, Wesley is bitten by one of them. He manages to kill the demon with Aquaman's help as the hero tells the dying man he bested the demon in a moment of terror, having shown them their fear. Aquaman uses his telepathy to call three giant megalodons to attack Surtur, injuring the demon who doubles over in pain as Power Girl shoots out of his gut. Power Girl reunites with Superman as the Flash intends on initiating his black hole plan, speeding round and round the villain as Starman and Green Lantern hold Surtur in place. The plan begins to work and small black holes begin forming on the villain, eating away at his flesh. Surtur finds this all rather impressive for a bunch of mid-guardians, but he manages to raise his sword cutting the Flash in two and ending their plan. Ella knows they can still do this but Starman is killed by the sword as the villain's bowels spill out onto Johnny, Ted and Aquaman, killing them instantly. Angered, Superman has had enough of the villain's killings, freezing the villain's face with his freeze breath and smashing it open. Angered, the villain grabs Superman, wondering how he should just kill the flaccid myth of Superman. Alan calls for the villain to stop the madness, telling them that it's over since Serta knows they can't beat him, but now Serta is free from the chains of Asgard and he must want something because of that. Serta says he only wants destruction and to cause Ragnarok. The defeated Alan says that ever since he put on the ring, he and the other heroes always found victory, no matter how hard it was fought for, but he's seen too many of his friends burn to ignore Serta's power, wondering what would happen if they didn't stop the demon, telling him that what if he could destroy world after world, just not New Earth. Serta intends on killing Alan for daring to plead to him to spare the world at the cost of millions more, but Alan Alan confirms that that's what he said, saying that he will be Surtur's avatar and will guide him and his armies to new worlds to destroy, on the one condition that he never return to New Earth. Surtur laughs at the offer, saying that his world, his bloodline, and even their Superman mean nothing to him, since destruction is its own end and Earth is not unique to him, but Alan would offer it all to defend it, as well as his dignity, which the villain finds utterly delicious. Alan says that if it saves Earth and preserves their future for generations to come, then there isn't anything he wouldn't do. He wants to get on with it, so funneling all his power into him, Serta accepts the deal, turning Alan Scott into the Dread Lantern. Alan tells Todd that he is so sorry as he disappears into the cosmos along with Serta and his armies. Tempest watches the events unfold, wondering if the true cost Alan Scott paid can ever be reckoned with. Thanks to his sacrifice, New Earth lives on with the JSE, but thanks to Alan's deal, many worlds across the multiverse die as he guides Serta to one world after another. Tempest knows that New Earth's safety comes on the damning words of an unholy oath as the Dread Lantern destroys one more world, uttering his broken oath as the planet explodes. Tales from the Dark Multiverse, a Crisis on Infinite Earths issue 1, was another really awesome and totally different what if story from the Dark Multiverse and from Steve Orlando, who does a wonderful job playing with the JSA and delivering a very sad, yet a little hopeful story. Like the last two stories, this issue was again a little bit more hopeful than I anticipated for a Dark Multiverse story, but in true Dark Multiverse fashion, all of that hope is built on darkness, and in this case, Green Lantern becomes Silver Surfer to Surta, who in turn becomes very similar to Galactus. It's a cool idea on top of an even cooler idea that Earth 2 was the one who survived the crisis on the Infinite Earths instead of Earth 1. Steve Orlando writes some utterly fantastic character moments here for each survivor, from Superman getting reminded of who he is, to Johnny Thunder and Ted Grant bonding over not just their survival, but their integral places in the JSA, despite them often thinking they aren't all that important. It was really great in an issue that featured such large-scale action and death of heroes that we got these really quiet moments to help reinforce these heroes' values. Even though this is the Dark Multiverse, they still stand as heroes. I really, really enjoyed enjoyed this issue and I'm intrigued what's going to happen with the final issue of this series, seeing as that it's a Dark Knight's 
Knights Metal issue, which is very weird considering that's the event that kind of kicked off the Dark Multiverse, so I'm intrigued to see what writers will do with that premise. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10.